just to start off, like, what was your inspiration for writing this book? Um, yeah, so I started writing this book um, when I was in high school, and I wanted to write um, about a summer lake story. I just like really liked the idea of like a summer on a lake, but I like had no real plan for what that was going to look like. Um, and I just taken U.S. history, and I was really interested in researching and learning more and writing about the Jim Crow era because I felt like, you know, we talked about it in high school, but we like only really touched on it. Um, and then there was this quote by Albert Camus that I like, which translated into English is, in the depth of winter, I finally found that within me there lay an invincible summer. And high school me was just like obsessed with that quote. Um, and I loved the idea of an invincible summer. And so it all just kind of like came together into the story. Speaking to like your inspiration for the book, were there any like high school authors um, or like authors that you read like in high school or like middle school that inspired you um, like as, as a young writer? Mm -hmm. um, I was definitely inspired a lot by Jacqueline Woodson um, and her book. She was one of the first black authors that I ever read as a kid. Um, and it was just like really cool seeing that representation. And then um, why am I blanking on her name? The author of Divergent, Veronica something. <laughs> um, you pointed to say Veronica Mars, so that's not right. Um, but she was really young when she published um, Divergent, and I think she was around my age or like in her early mid-20s. Um, so definitely like reading that and knowing how young she was made me feel like I could do it too. Yeah, I hear you on that. I feel like one of the books that like really like impacted me in terms of like social justice and like um, like social impact was Pam Munoz Ryan's um, Esperanza Rising. Um, mm -hmm. And that story was like, um, it was just interesting like seeing the character like develop and also knowing like the historical background of like that character. Um, so yeah. And as we talk about like history and like the historical background, you said that you were interested in writing the um, book after like taking your US history course. And I wanted to know more about like why you decided to base the story in 1955. Yeah, so I knew I wanted to set the story before the civil rights movement was like really in full swing. So in the 50s. Um, and as I was like thinking about specific years, um, 1955 was the year that Claudette Colvin um, got arrested for not giving a receipt to a white woman on a bus. Um, 1955 was the year Emmett Till was murdered. Um, and so those two moments especially have so much significance. And I think just like that to me when I was researching it really felt like the beginnings in a way that like, I mean, obviously the, the beginnings were like, when Europeans started enslaving African people, but um, that like felt like sort of the beginning of the movement. And, and so I wanted to set it like right at the cusp. Cool, so I think it's really interesting that the book like is being released now because there's so much ha happening um, like nationally and internationally in terms of like race and like social justice. Um, so I think it's like, like perfect timing that this story is being shared, especially um, for like a younger audience because they're still aware and involved of what's going on around them. Um, which is also like super interesting to see, not trying to give away too much information, but just to see um, like the character development and um, like how you describe and like let us get to know the characters and the book. And something I was also curious about learning more about is like Ethan's relationship with Juniper. Um, what inspired you to write their friendship? I, when I was a teenager, I like, I read so much. I loved reading, but I was always like so frustrated by the romantic subplots that were like literally in every single book that I liked. And like, it would take over the story and I would just get so mad. And so like, I had like a thing where in high school, I just like would not write romantic subplots. But I especially like, I wanted to read more books about young people just being friends, um, especially like 
boy, boys and girls being friends because like that just I don't know like that's just not a thing that happens in a lot of YA literature um so yeah I really wanted to like focus on that platonic love and and you know really highlighting um their friendship yeah and it's super interesting to see like their friendship be so like pure and genuine um and something that was really interesting to me was to see how um, Juniper kind of served as like an ally instead of like a white savior trope. Um, so like, can you give us more information about how you decided to like write her character in this way um, and give her the characteristics that she had? Yeah, I definitely didn't want her to be perfect and like she does have moments in the book where she messes up um but I wanted to write her as just a person who general genuinely cares about other people and um understands that like part of caring about other people is being anti-racist and like being an ally um and yeah I especially wanted to represent that in a younger person um partly because I think that like teens now are like some of the most thoughtful and like social justice oriented people in the world um but also just to to sort of have that as a model of um of what a friend like that can look like even though she's not perfect but also like in her mistakes um the ways that she still tries to support you then mm -hmm. and i think um a point you made was like really spoke out to me was her imperfections and like how you show her growth as a character um, throughout her journey in the summer is super interesting to me because like she allows herself to like make mistakes. She acknowledges her mistakes and then she like grows from them. And I feel like they grow stronger because they're able to have that like open and honest like conversation and understanding between each other. Um, which is something that I really appreciate. And yeah. oh. another um, character that wasn't necessarily my favorite in the book was Ethan's dad. And throughout this story, he's very, um, like, not naive, but, like, oblivious to the fact that his son is, like, half Black, and that makes him, like, Black especially in 1955 and his decision to send him to like the south during that time period was just very frustrating to me personally um <laughs> but i just wanted to know like what inspired you to write that his father in that way and kind of like what your um like perception of ignorance versus like being oblivious versus like being innocent Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with his dad, like, I really wanted to channel, like, I, what I feel like I see a lot of, like, this well-meaning white person and, like, also, like, a well-meaning white parent who doesn't get it but, like, thinks they're always doing the best for their kids and, like, it all is coming from a really good place, but that doesn't excuse the impact that it has. Um, and so I wanted to sort of well, first of all, I needed a reason why Ethan wouldn't get sent to the stuff in the first place. So logistically, there was that. Um, but yeah, I also wanted to have his dad be like this complicated person in his life who like, he knows that his dad loves him and like he cares about his dad, but he is causing him this harm. Um, and I think on the idea of, of obliviousness versus ignorance versus innocence, um, yeah, I think often we use them interchangeably. I think now there's more conversation of the idea of innocence being less of like a, not a valid, yet like less of a valid concept because we talk about like making sure kids are innocent and like, what do we really mean by that? And there's this question of who gets to be innocent um, and especially like young black children and, and kids of color often don't get to be labeled as innocent um, and they're expected to have grown up a lot faster than white peers. Um, 
so yeah I wanted to kind of explore that idea and like I think his dad you know was oblivious and ignorant but um I think his innocence was kind of a like constructed idea like he was he was innocent but really he was just innocent from understanding the impact of his own actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you talk about like innocence, especially in youth, I feel like people always, or in the past, people have assumed that like children are like innocent and oblivious to what's going on, but like you wrote this type of story in high school. So I feel like there is an understanding among young people, especially now, especially with social media, of what's going on and like we have a better not a better understanding but we definitely understand right from wrong um mm-hmm. and a lot of the stuff going on now is wrong like obviously wrong um yeah. and i kind of wanted to know like more about your editing process throughout this like throughout your journey of writing and releasing this book i know you said you started it in high school and um yeah if you could kind of to like your editing process and your journey and creating and finalizing the story? Yeah, I, so I wrote it my senior year of high school um, and like finished the manuscript and then like didn't really touch it again for a while. I like had a couple friends read chapters of it in college and like workshops, but I never like seriously pursued um, the manuscript again. Um, but then when I um, got the opportunity to publish it with Wattpad. I like went through a very rigorous editing process um, and my editor was amazing. And she um, just like truly went through with a fine tooth comb and like take out all these different little things. And also like, I think it was a good challenge for me in a lot of ways because I had done some research when I was 17, but like, I also didn't really know how to do good research when I was 17. Mm -hmm. And I got really hung up in like the aesthetics of the fifties versus like the social concerns. Um, And so in editing a lot of it was really like, I um, was doing a lot more research into like what was actually happening and like what people were experiencing um and making that more of a thread throughout the book um versus just being like they're at a mall shop and they're wearing like poodle skirts or whatever (laughs) um and I think it's really cool kind of what you were saying earlier about teenagers being more aware It's, it's cool because I when I was a teenager there was just a lot that I didn't know and I mean I guess for every teenager there's a lot that they don't know but to mm-hmm. think about like the stuff that I put into this book especially during editing um and a lot of the questions that I was grappling with and to know that a lot of teenagers now are like already thinking about those questions of like the idea of innocence for certain kids and like ideas of colorism and like that's just so cool to me I think that's amazing yeah I think it's it's really great to see like how the youth is really progressing. I say that like I'm not like young, but I guess I'm not <laughs> in high school anymore. So like, uh, but um, and just, as we're talking about like youth development and like the changes that young people are bringing, young people like us, I guess, because we're still yeah. <laughs> um, like the changes that we're bringing in society. Really interesting how you wrote like the emotional growth of Ethan um because I know like like men in general like males um don't aren't always encouraged to like express their emotion but like especially black males aren't always encouraged to express their emotions um so what was your or I guess like in the past technically yeah um what was your like inspiration for showing that emotional like development and growth um for Ethan yeah I think it was never really a question for me I was so fed up with the idea as many of us are that men aren't supposed to show emotion especially that black men are supposed to be like tough and resilient only um and 
so, you know, for me in, in writing this book and like thinking about all the emotions that Ethan would be dealing with, I, it felt like, you know, it, it was impossible for him to not have moments of vulnerability and to not show how he was feeling. Um, and so, yeah, I just kind of like, it was never really a question. I was just like, this is how he's going to be. Yeah. And I really appreciate how it like really allowed us to get more insight into like how traumatic um, like experiencing racism can be and how everyone like handles that trauma differently and like deals mm -hmm. with it and releases it differently. Um, yeah, and then another interesting set of characters were um, Uncle Robert and Aunt Kara. Um, what was your like inspiration for writing their characters and like their growth? Um, something that like really spoke to me was when you were, or not to give too much detail, but like what <laughs> finally allowed them to see like Ethan as a person? Um, and can you kind of speak to like your inspiration for that like journey of those two characters? Mm -hmm. So when I thought of Aunt Car and Uncle Robert, I was kind of thinking of like a classic like sitcom couple from like the 1950s or 60s or whatever, like, I don't know, like the Brady Bunch parents or something who like, perfectly nice people, but like probably if you had dropped a black child into their lives, like wouldn't handle it so well. Um, and I did, I did really want, I didn't want all my characters to be like irredeemable, even the ones who were complicated. Um, and so I was really just thinking about like, how can I make them grow and understand and be better without, you know, excusing their behavior, um, and excusing the impact it has on Ethan, but also like still giving them the chance to, to make that growth. Um, mm -hmm. and I think like even within the confines of the story, that's just like a small piece of their growth. Like in my imaginary universe of this story, I see them continuing to work at it for the rest of their lives. But I think, yeah, I just really, I didn't want to dismiss them offhand as being irredeemable and like wanted to give them a chance to do that work yeah and just talking about like um things that are irredeemable um we kind of go into towards the end of the book there is kind of this or I guess the overall one of the overall questions I had while reading the book was what was the difference between like getting justice and getting closure oh mm -hmm. to like I guess for your own well-being, like be not satisfied, but be able to move on. Um, and can you kind of speak to like what your inspiration or like what you want us to take away from like those two differences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in thinking about like justice and closure, I think I was thinking a lot about forgiveness. And like, this is probably a controversial opinion that my mom who's listening is not going to like, but I don't necessarily believe that forgiveness is necessary. I think that like, some people deserve it. And I also think that some people like maybe don't. And I think that there are ways to get closure without having to have this big forgiveness mm -hmm. toward a person who harmed you. Um, and, and, you know, like Ethan, I think that he doesn't forgive his relatives necessarily for the way that they treated him or his dad for sending him to Alabama, but, um, he is able to accept that it happened and, and sort of begin a conversation about the way that it harmed him. And, and so it's kind of like my thinking is like the sort of restorative justice model versus like apologize and tell the other person you're sorry and then they forgive you because I think it needs to be a conversation um and I think that like the person who did harm has to acknowledge the harm mm -hmm. that they did even if they are sorry like it's something that they have to sit with yeah definitely um yeah 
I definitely understand your sentiments on that one, especially with like just hearing the two sides of each character and like their justification for why they behave that way. Like Aunt Kara and Uncle Robert's like justification for why they treated Ethan that way was not like a real justification in my opinion. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have a lot to say about that. Yeah. I don't think we have enough time. Um, <laughs> And so just, um, I think we have actually, one second, we have some questions in the chat um, from Sophia she said, hello, I'm curious if you listen to music while you write and if so, what do you listen to? Did you listen to music from the 50s and 60s while writing the book? Also, I love the albums displayed on the wall of both of your rooms. Thank you. Um, Thank you, this is my my gal. Um, I I do listen to music. I think it when I wrote this originally, I did listen to a lot of fifties music at the time, and like a lot of jazz and some of the albums that Ethan really likes, like Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, Nina Simone. Um, which is partly because like I that's music I love anyway. Um, and also because I am, I do like to write to some kind of soundtrack. Like I, if it's dead silent, I usually have a hard time thinking, but I, I like something like soft and quiet and something that like sets the mood for whatever I'm writing. Um, more recently I found that I like, will just, I'll be writing and I'll be like, oh, I really just need to listen to like this one artist. And so then like, I listen to like, Taylor Swift for an hour like <laughs> like as I'm writing um and I don't know I feel like a lot of the time it's like nostalgia because I wrote a lot when I was younger and like I feel like sometimes the kind of music I was into then like comes back up and I'm like oh I want to listen to this while I write again yeah definitely and just to your point like I'm a huge jazz fan um so like I definitely love Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald, and um, just like seeing the references that you made, I was like, ah, Billy <laughs> Holiday. Um, and I think it's also like really interesting to see like how music and like art was created during like different um, like time periods, like during the 50s, well, like the Harlem Renaissance, like the 20s and like the 50s mm -hmm. and how they were like, social justice movements and like the art that was created out of that and I wanted to know mm -hmm. if there's like any similarities and differences and like the music that you are listening to like like that you're listening to now as like there's a lot going on like in the world mm -hmm. I think like especially in the past few months I've returned a lot to listening to especially Nina Simone um and I think like also in the new artists that I listen to, I do tend to look for songs that feel like they're about something of like significance. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the book, I was really interested about this, like the like ever persistent culture of people loving black music, but not loving black people. Um, and so I was really interested in like, you know, um, all the artists that Ethan listened to were like so, so popular um, that they like crossed color lines, but really like they were all involved in social justice movements. And yeah. I just think it's really interesting. Yeah. And to your point, like that, I really appreciate how you touched on like the colorism in society um and how certain black people are more accepted closer to like white passing that they are and i kind of want to hear like what like what do you want the reader to take away from like that reference and like what was your like inspiration for including that yeah i think um i mean for myself as a biracial person i feel like I'm constantly having conversations with myself about colorism and the idea that like I've experienced racism, but 
it's to different degrees than folks who are darker skinned. Um, and so I think that's something that we're talking about more and more, but I don't think it's something that I've really seen um, explored, especially with younger audiences. And so I wanted to kind of like set that, that seed of thinking about it. Um, and yeah, like, I mean, the book is, primarily about Ethan experiencing racism. Um, but I also wanted to, there to be some level of understanding that like his experiences are different from, for example, his mom's experiences or from um, other black folks in the South. And, and it complicates everything. It makes it a lot harder to think about, but I think it's really important to like work yeah. through that. Yeah. And I really appreciate how you, like you said, like, um, like sowing those seeds, like planting the seeds and like people's mind in a subtle way that kind of like, as you're reflecting on the book after you read it, it's like different things that you've introduced to a younger audience that definitely need to be discussed and definitely need to be like understood, especially like at a younger age. Um, mm -hmm. yeah and just as we talk about like planting the seeds and having like conversations that need to be had um, with like younger audiences how do you feel like younger like books for the youth like communicate that yeah I think um, especially more recently so many books have been coming out that are just like really on point with how they deal with social issues and, and um, you know, young people navigating identities. And I think that a big part of that is that there's just a lot more own voices writing that's happening and like just more and more um, younger, but authors of every age, I think, who are drawing from their own experiences and their own identities to write fiction. Um, and I think that's really powerful as a force for like, helping young people to like understand the different parts of themselves and to understand um, their peers who may not look like them. Um, and yeah, I think it's just like the more people who are writing fiction from a place of like understanding the experience, the more honest it will be. Yeah, definitely. And we have uh, another question from Holly. Did you find while editing or writing, would you read books focusing on similar topics that you were exploring, exploring in your work? To some degree, yes. But I think like I, I wouldn't sit down and read an entire book that was all related to what I was writing about because I like, it's just so much of thinking about the same topic. Um, but definitely I had like books that I would consult to think about like this particular idea or like this particular character trait um, and like come back to that throughout the process. But usually I, I'll read something that's not totally related. Yeah. And as we're like talking about like books that inspire you, um, I guess like what do you see for how do you see like the literary world like growing and developing as we progress um towards like a more just world yeah i mean i think now there are just so many books out there by black authors by authors of color um by queer authors that are just so good good is such a lazy word but it's they're like so good like I I recently read The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett um which if you haven't read it is incredible um and just like seeing this like own voices writer and the way she like built this incredible story is just amazing and I think that like I think that our the books we read start to reflect the world we're living in more and more um and so I think that I don't know that one is necessarily leading the other, but I think that like as we move to a more just future, books will come with that and books will also be like leading the way. Yeah, definitely. 
And as we like go back to the book and the story, another um, character that I really was interested in hearing from was Ethan's mom. And she kind of talks like, she talks about a revolution um, and like a revolution that is happening and developing. And I wanted to know like, what was your inspiration for writing her character like in the way that you did? Um, and if you can kind of speak to like, what you like perceive the revolution to have been or to be now? Yeah, so I, um, I wrote her character because I really wanted Ethan to have um, this like black role model that he could look up to because obviously like, the story is mostly white characters and then like Ethan. Um, and I didn't want it to all be about him just like trying to defend himself against them, but also like, to have someone who is this source of like information and also like understanding um and so that's that's why I wrote his mom's character the way that I did and I think um yeah I mean she talks about how a revolution is coming I think the revolution was coming then and it was coming like 500 years ago and it's still here now and um I think like it has different faces every time it comes up, but it is still very much like at its core a fight for black lives and a fight for um, just futures. And yeah, I think like, you know, the book is set in 19, 1955 and his mom says it then, but um, I hope that it, that like resonates still today. Yeah. And we have another question. Um, it says, I'm interested to know how you think Ethan and Juniper would fare if they existed in this summer in 2020, knowing their personalities. Do you think if they spent this summer as friends simu similarly to the time period in the book, lived experience versus allyship and navigating their world on either side of these is challenging? Do you think their friendship could last through the summer of 2020, all things considered? This is a good question. question. I love this question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so part of why I said it in 1955 was because I like don't really know how to write about technology and like that brings in so many complications of like the access to information, the access to people. And so I kind of wanted to like, to like get rid of all those distractions and really just focus on the characters. And I think that if this story was happening now, I think like Ethan and Juniper would both be coming from totally different places. Like Ethan's naivete that he has in, in the story just wouldn't be as believable now um, as it was then. And even then it's like still like, little far-fetched but like I think you know he would maybe come into the story with more of an understanding of racism but maybe not like so much of an experience of it and I think Juniper also um I think that setting it in 1955 like cut her a little slack like I think she not that she could get away with more but um it really was more of a, a way to explore her character as like really learning and growing. And I think that uh, Juniper right now, um, you know, would still be doing that work as, as many people are. But I think that um, mista any mistakes she made would be a lot more tenuous between her and Ethan. Um, because in some ways there's like less of an excuse now. Not that it was ever an excuse, but um yeah I think it would it would change their characters both a lot um yeah yeah I definitely uh, yeah I agree and that was a really great question um and kind of just like as we're talking about the characters do you like foresee yourself um writing more like stories about these characters or like sharing what happens after like their summer together like how even goes on yeah I can definitely see myself being one of those like authors or creators who like 
their series or whatever ends and they're still like creating all these like fantastic like whatever is happening next like I don't know I'm thinking of like this show called Cheer on the Princesses of Power and the creator Noel Stevenson um, the series has ended but she'll still post like oh and this is the name of these two characters child and like this is where these characters live I could totally see myself being that kind of person um I have all kinds of thoughts about where I feel like my characters ended up and especially Ethan like past the summer um but I don't know it feels like a complete story to me already and I don't know that I necessarily write these characters again Cool. And like, as we're talking about, as we're talking about like children's books, how do you see, I guess, how do you see like the increase in children's books impacting like education as a whole or like the diversification of children's books? Yeah, I think it's especially exciting that teaching young adult fiction is becoming more and more acceptable versus like always having to teach literary fiction that was written by the western canon um i think that like the more that we allow newer voices into education the more like kids are gonna learn um and so that's like a really exciting thing to see i think just like in general kids being able to read about people their own age who are growing up in a similar context and maybe people who look like them or people who don't just to understand someone else's um, experiences. I think that's just like really valuable in like, not just like education is like a learning about writing and different kinds of whatever, but in just like learning how to be a good, person in the world yeah and we definitely need more good people in the world (laughs) Um, yeah and as we talk about like like people in the world what is like some takeaways or like messages you want to take from this book Mm -hmm. um a big thing is that even though it is set in 1955 and that's like 70 years ago or whatever um I definitely want it to be clear to folks who read it that um unfortunately the the issues that Ethan is facing in this book with racism um haven't gone away they've just changed shape and form and um I think like again going back to like why I wanted to set it in 1955 like I wanted those sentiments to be very clear because I think like allows for like a way to to look at what Ethan experienced and then like sort of clearly transfer over to what people are experiencing now even if it looks a little different um and the other thing is that I just think friendship is so important um which is like cheesy I don't know like it's like friendship is magic I think is the My Little Ponies like (laughs) slogan Um, But, like, it is, and I think that um, coming out of this book, I do want people to feel, to feel, like, validated in their close friendships and, and you know, to want to have those close friendships. Yeah, and as we talk about, like, friendship and allyship, are there any, is there anything, like, if someone's trying to learn how to like be a better friend or be a better ally, like are there any recommendations that you would have um, for them? Hmm. I think um, a lot of it is just reading more from the perspective of people who are different from you. Like I think just the more that you diversify the fiction and the nonfiction that you're reading, um, the more empathetic you become. And I think that like, yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely like mistakes to be made and to learn from, but I don't think there's really like a how-to guide on how to be a better ally or how to be a better friend. I think it's, it's a lot of it is like learning from experience and also learning from other stories. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and I feel like Juniper was really not not necessarily the ideal friend, but she definitely complimented Ethan um, and like their characteristics and their personality. And what like what was your inspiration, or what made you decide to like do their um, to create their characters and the nature and light that they're in? Mm -hmm. Um. Juniper was really inspired a lot by like um, Star Girl and Anne of Green Gables and Pippi Longstocking and like sort of that young female heroine who is really just like excited about life and like wants to spread that with everyone. Um, but I also did want her to, you know, she is like a lead in the story. And she is sort of this heroine, but I also didn't want her to be, like, saving Ethan. Like, she is there to be his friend and to be someone who is empathetic to him and who cares about him. But also, like, I wanted to give him the agency to figure out his own experiences. Um, and then Ethan, I don't know. I think that, like, my, like, lead characters tend to be... Ethan-esque, like, kind of quieter, um, and, um, yeah, I don't know, not, like, as outgoing, and I feel like that's, like, a cliche, but it's also, like, that was, like, I would read books like that in high school, and I was, like, oh, my God, like, that's me. I'm the quiet girl. Um, <laughs> so, I think, like, that's kind of a holdover of, like, writing that kind of character but I think I also I really do value in books that I read and in what I write characters who are introverts and who are quieter and like the way that you can learn a lot just through like hearing their thoughts and like the ways that they interact throughout the story yeah and I feel like it was very interesting to see um him be the more quiet type because just because he wasn't speaking doesn't mean he like didn't feel anything and like his feelings and thoughts, like when he did speak or when he expressed himself, they were very significant in like the pro progression of the story. Um, so yeah, I really appreciated it. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, and as we like finish up, are there any like book recommendations that you have for people or, um, yeah, any inspiring books that you would recommend? Yeah, um, I have a lot, but I won't name all of them. Um, the Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, um, which I mentioned earlier, but it's about these uh, twins who are from this town where it's, it's a Black town, but people um, are, try by like who they're marrying to like make their kids lighter and lighter and lighter. And so it's these two twins, it's like a wild, it's like wild. Um, it's these two twins who are like very light skinned and fairly white passing. And one goes on to like marry a black man and like remain in her town. And the other like disappears and passes as white and nobody knows that she's a black woman. And it's just mind boggling. It's so good. Um, so that's definitely a big one. Um, also, Little and Lion, um, which is a YA novel about um, a Black bisexual girl who, like, comes back from a year at boarding school and is, like, trying to figure out her identities. Um, it's just, like, very sweet and very well-written. Um, and then I just read Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo, um, and she's a poet, so it's written in birth. Um, and it's the first time I've read something in birth in quite a while, and it was just so beautiful it's about these two sisters um one who grew up in New York and one who grew up in Puerto Rico or in the Dominican Republic and they have the same dad but neither of them knew about each other um because the dad had like these two families and it's about them discovering each other and like forming a relationship um so yeah I think those would be my big three right now Super. Um, I'm currently reading James Baldwin. Um, I'm on... Me too! <laughs> <laughs> yes, wait, which one is this? Is this Nobody... The Fire Next Time. Oh, The Fire Next Time. Okay, I'm on... 
what is it nobody knows my name um and it's just very interesting because he's talking about like there's this one passage where he talks about um like how the artist becomes the politician um and they're able to like speak for the people one quote that like one of his like just in general um one of his quotes that really inspires me is how i forgot how it goes exactly but he talks about how like there's like it's the artist's role to remind people that nothing is perfect under heaven and i feel like mm. especially now in the age of social media and the way like the social impact and the social change that's happening um it's really nice to see artists like be able to communicate like the not the words of the people but like people's like emotions and perspectives um mm -hmm. like on a mass scale um so yeah also toni morrison oh, one of yeah, my always. love 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 um yeah and i know you mentioned there's some organizations that you wanted to um that if anyone is interested in supporting um davin put together a quick list of some organizations you all can support um it's 826 la which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting students ages from 6 to 18 with their creative and expo expository writing skills and helping teachers inspire their students to write get lit um words ignite which is a nonprofit organization that uses poetry to inspire literacy, empower youth, and inspire communities. And then Iso Wan Books, is, am I pronouncing that one right? Okay, yeah. great. Um, which is a black owned bookstore in LA, um, which you all can shop at as well. And Davin, is there anything um, you'd like to add before we wrap up? Um, I don't think so. Just think, thanks, Naila, for. For moderating this it was great to talk to you again after you. so long it was so nice um being able to speak with you again under these circumstances which is like yeah despite the pandemic and everything that's going on it's so nice to be able to like be in your position and be able to like see how you've grown since i've last like seen you even though it's virtually um and yeah. be able to talk to you so thank you and for those who are interested where can we find your book um, you can find my book at your favorite, well, okay, you can find your, my book at, like, anywhere that sells books for the most part, but I would specifically recommend that you buy it from your favorite indie bookstore, um, and if you don't currently have a favorite, if you go on bookshop.com or indiebound.com, you can find some great bookstores to support, um, and also, if there's a Black-owned bookstore that you know of in your area, or honestly, wherever that does shipping, then totally support them. Yay! Thank you so much, Davin. Thank you.